invite us to open our Bibles to a text that we have looked at several times during the course of this wonderful Christmas season. Matthew's Gospel, the 16th chapter. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, we'll be looking, reading in a moment, verses 13 through 17. But by way of introduction, let me share with you several little poignant uh, tidbits in relationship to uh, Christmas. Did you know each year more than 3 billion Christmas cards are sent in the U.S. alone? 3 billion Christmas cards. Did you know the traditional uh, three colors of Christmas are green, red, and gold? Green has long been a symbol for life and rebirth. Uh, Red symbolizes the blood of Christ, and the gold represents light as well as wealth and royalty, biblically speaking. Here's a poignant statement. I'll tell you who said it in a moment. How many observe Christ's birthday? How few his Precepts, Benjamin Franklin. Alabama was the first state in the United States to officially recognize Christmas in 1836, but Christmas wasn't declared an official holiday in the United States until June the 26th, 1870. There are two competing claims as to uh, which president was the first to place a Christmas tree in the White House. Some scholars say President Franklin Pierce did in 1856. Others say President Benjamin Harrison brought in the first tree in 1889. It was President Coolidge that started the White House lighting ceremony in 1923. It is estimated that the single white Christmas by Irvin Berlin is the best-selling single of all times with over 100 million sales worldwide. No court in America has ever ruled that government officials are constitutionally required to censor Christmas, and yet we have the attempt to do so on an annual basis. May we stand together as I read audibly, follow with me in your scriptures, Matthew's Gospel, the thir- uh, 16th chapter, verses 13 through 17, we read, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Thank you, and we may be seated. Peter's great confession, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. May I tell us, it is possible, it is entirely possible to know Jesus Christ personally through the faith in that which has been accomplished on Calvary's cross, that finished work of Calvary. Throughout the scripture, by the way, we find that Jesus is known as Lord, Master, Wonderful, Counselor, Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. However, may I say to us very simplistically, for the child of God, for the Christian, perhaps he is best known as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. May I remind us that we find Jesus Christ in the Scripture while in the flesh, his last Passover celebration with his disciples he literally became the Passover lamb that shed his blood that we might have remission of sin. There are five brief things that I want us to see as we think on the subject, behold the lamb, behold the lamb. I want us to notice several things, five in particular, the lamb promised, the lamb pictured, the lamb provided, the lamb pierced, and the lamb positioned. Behold the Lamb. It was John the Baptist that said that. In John 
chapter 1, verse 29, as Jesus entered and John the Baptist as his forerunner, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Notice, first of all, the Lamb promised. The Lamb promised. Turn in your Bibles with me to Genesis, the 22nd chapter. Genesis chapter 22. And may we look at verses 1 through 8, and the emphasis will be on verse 7 and 8. Wonderful, wonderful precursor of the coming of the Lamb, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. You know the setting, you know the story. It's where God had told Abram, uh, which later became Abraham, to take his son, his only son, and take him up to the mountain on Mount Moriah, and he was to sacrifice him as a sacrifice. And the Scripture says, and it came to pass after these things, that God did tempt, that is to test, to try, to prove Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and notice now the emphasis, thy only son, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave that is split, cut the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then, all, then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide, that means to stay, to dwell, to stay here uh, with the ass. And I and the lad will go yonder and worship. Notice now, they're going to worship. And sacrifice is provided in the worship. And worship had come again to you. And Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and the burnt offering, and of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand, and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father. Isaac is about 18 to 20 years old. He's not a six-year-old or five-year-old. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, Look intently and see the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Reading verse 7 and 8 again. And Isaac spake unto Abraham the father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? For a burnt offering. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they both went of them together. Listen very carefully. We see the lamb is promised, and it's found in the Genesis 22 text. And may I remind us throughout all of history, throughout all of the Old Testament history in particular, it was the slaying of an animal and the shedding of blood that sins could be remitted. The shedding of blood was required then. The shedding of blood is required now for the remission of sin. But in the Old Testament culture and the setting, uh, there was the need to go in once a year and uh, the uh, lamb would be uh, slain and the blood would be poured on the altar of sacrifice. And it was for the remission of sin for a year. And every year, they'd all have to come back and offer the sacrificial lamb uh, that sins might be remitted. But I want us to understand the Lamb promised, first of all, the prophecy. God, verse 8, God will provide himself a Lamb. This is the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. After Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, after the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that theologically, academically, symbolically, theoretically, and actually, Jesus Christ became that sacrificial lamb on that Passover celebration where his blood was shed for the remission of sin for all of the world, whosoever will may come. This is foreshadowing the lamb, the shed blood, of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. This Lamb promised is none other than Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world. Not only do we see the prophecy, but the promise in verse 8. For an offering in Genesis 22, 8, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, gave himself as a sacrifice 
as an offering on Mount Calvary for your sins and for mine. Too often at Christmas time, we focus on the beautiful tinsel decorated Christmas tree. There's nothing wrong with that. Too often we focus on the babe in Bethlehem. There's nothing wrong with that. Too often we focus on all of the glitz and the glitter and the sightseeing and the shopping and the socializing and all of these things that come into play and mar the beauty of what Christmas is all about. It's about the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, that the scripture says was slain from before the foundation of the world for your sins and for mine. The lamb is promised, but I want us to notice also the lamb is pictured. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus, Exodus the 12th chapter. Exodus chapter 12, we find beginning in verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man, notice, a lamb. It's very interesting, very needful for us to see. A lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, goes from a lamb to the lamb specific. Let him and his neighbor uh, next unto the house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. Verse 5, your lamb, it's a lamb, the lamb, and then it's personalized your lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the post uh, side post, the, top, uh, the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein they shall eat. And they shall eat the flesh in the night roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it eat not of it raw nor sodden it at all with water but roast with fire uh, his head and his legs and the pertinences thereof and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning and that which remaineth of it until the morning shall ye burn with fire and thus shall ye eat it with your loins gird, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and would smite the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Listen to what the scripture is saying as we see the lamb pictured. Uh, what is the lamb? What is it to be like? There are two, three things that I want us to notice. It's to be a perfect lamb, a personal lamb, and a pierced lamb. It's to be a perfect lamb. Verse 5 in Exodus chapter 12 says, A lamb without blemish. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, had no sin, did no sin, could do no sin. He was perfect, high, holy, harmless, and undefiled, and separate from sinners, according to the Scripture. He was the perfect God-man, 100% God, 100% man, as a result of the virgin birth. Jesus Christ coming into this world via the virgin's womb is the perfect lamb that was slain on Calvary's cross for your sins and for mine. The scripture says of the Lamb of God, he is sinless and he's undefiled, he's holy. And may I remind us, in Hebrews 7, 26, says he is separate from sinners. The Lamb is pictured. He's a perfect Lamb, without spot, without blemish. But he is also a personal Lamb. Notice as we looked at verse 5 in Exodus 12, your Lamb, a Lamb, the lamb, then your lamb. Listen very carefully to what we must understand and glean from this text. We must understand, we can talk about generically speaking, that Jesus Christ is the lamb of God that came before the foundation of the world and shed his rich red royal blood for your sins and for mine. We can talk about his uh, uh, salvation that's so full and free. We can talk about the fact that through faith in Jesus Christ, our sins can be remitted, our sins can be forgiven, and our sins can be covered, that we shall 
be whitish snow. But listen, until we personalize that lamb, until that generically speaking lamb becomes your lamb, my lamb, until we say yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. He is simply a lamb and the lamb, but he must become my lamb and your lamb. And the only way that's possible is by our saying yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. It's an impossibility for me to be saved for you or you to be saved for son or daughter. Moms cannot do it for sons and daughters. Dads cannot be saved for sons and daughters. The pastor, the Sunday school teacher, the best friend on the face of this earth cannot be saved for you. It is an individual experience that we must have that uh, shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is available for all, but it's efficacious. That means beneficial for only those that accept Jesus Christ as my lamb. We personalize our relationship to God through Jesus Christ by a volitional choice to say yes to him as Savior and uh, as Lord. The shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is only personalized when we say yes to him. The question is, do you know him today? Do you know him as Savior and uh, as Lord? He died for the sins of the whole world, but the whole world shall not be saved. Only those that say yes to Jesus shall be saved. Then we see we're talking about the lamb is pictured. He's a perfect lamb, a personal lamb but he is a pierced lamb. Verse 6 of the Exodus 12 text says, and you shall kill it, kill it. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was uh, slain for your sins and for mine. When we look back at the biblical record of the uh, birth and the life and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ came into this world to die on Calvary's cross. He came into this world to shed his blood that we might have our sins remitted. The Lord Jesus Christ came to die for the sins of the world and shedding his rich red royal blood on Calvary's cross. There are two things about the blood of the Lamb of the Lord Jesus Christ that we must understand. The blood is shed and the blood is sprinkled according to the 6th and 7th verse of Exodus chapter 12. The blood of the sacrificial lamb must be shed. That means the lamb must die. Jesus Christ came to die for your sins and for mine and his blood is shed. It is a it is precious blood because of the uh, virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood is shed and then the blood must be sprinkled or applied. Applied in the 7th through the 13th verse of Exodus chapter 12. The blood of the lamb is shed. The Lord Jesus Christ shed his blood but that shed blood must be personally applied in our lives. Multitudes today go into churches across our nation and around the globe. Multitudes today have their names on a church roll someplace. Multitudes today have a denominational relationship. Mega, mega millions today feel that they are all right because they're a member of some church, some denominational hierarchy, some uh, right ritual rules and regulations that are being followed. But salvation is not available until we say yes to Jesus Christ and we apply the shed blood of Christ in our own lives. May I remind us, when we say yes to Jesus Christ, God the Father sees only the robe of Jesus Christ's righteousness covering us. The question is, are you covered in the blood? Are you covered in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Hebrews 9.22 tells us this, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission of sin. The shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is for your sins and my sins to be remitted, but that blood must be first applied. In Hebrew, in Exodus, the 12th chapter, when the lamb slain and the blood's applied, it's applied over the doorpost and the lintel of the door so that when the death angel passed through on that first Passover celebration, the death angel would pass over those in that household and the firstborn in that household would not be slain by the death angel. 
And we see the symbolic illustration there that when the blood is applied, then we're passed over. It's as uh, though we've never, ever sinned. We are justified before the Lord Jesus Christ. We are righteous in the robe of Jesus Christ's righteousness. Not our own righteousness, but his righteousness covers us in his shed blood. Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? There's an old song that answers that question. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in Him in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? We're talking about behold the Lamb. Not only do we see the Lamb is promised, and the Lamb is pictured, but the Lamb is also provided. The lamb is provided. In that text that I quoted earlier, in John chapter 1 and in verse 29, the next day John saith Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Verse 36 said, And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the lamb of God. So we see not only the lamb is promised and the lamb is pictured, but the lamb is provided. We see that presentation in verse 29 and 36 of John chapter 1. Behold, the lamb of God, the lamb is promised back in Genesis 22, and now he is presented, and it's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, God's little lamb, born in a stable, laid in a cradle, looking far forward of the cross, and soon coming again, crowned as king of kings and Lord of of lords. Our focus, our focus must be, our focus ought to be, our focus should be on Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. See, the presentation and the plan is found in that text also, which taketh away the sin of the world. Many times we quote or misquote that. Notice in the John chapter 1, verse 29 and verse 36 text, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin, singular, of the world. Not sins, plural, but sin. Why is this so? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Have you ever talked with anybody that says they've never sinned? I have. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. I had one dear lady a number of years ago while traveling in full-time evangelism, sitting in her living room with the pastor, and I shared with her the plan of salvation. And I said, do you believe that you're a sinner? And she said, uh, no, I don't think I sin. I don't think I sin. And I said, you don't think you're a sinner at all? No, sir. And I had to go back to Adam Wherefore, as but one man, sin came into the world, and death by sin, and therefore death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You can take the finest, beautiful, most beautiful baby in the world, and that child is a sinner. And it's because we're born with Adamic blood in our veins. It's because of Adam's fall that all of the human race fell into sin. It's not because you're a bad person or an individual is an evil, wicked person. It's because we have human blood flowing in our veins and the blood that flowed in Jesus' veins was God's blood because he was virgin born. But the blood that flows in your veins and in my veins is sin blood, sin tainted blood, Adamic blood, fallen blood. And as a result of that, we're prone to sin. And as a result of that, Jesus Christ's plan for coming into the world as the Lamb of God is to take away the sin of the world. The whole world is under God's condemnation for sin because of Adam. God's law says the soul that sinneth, it must die. And God provided a sacrificial lamb as a provision, as a means and a mechanism by which our sins can be remitted through the Lord Jesus Christ. Death on Calvary's cross. The lamb is promised. The lamb is pictured. The lamb is provided. But I want us to notice Fourthly, the lamb is pierced. The lamb is pierced. 
You can have a gift that's given. Can you picture on Christmas morning in your home, homes around the globe, where someone have, someone's gone out and they have meticulously, prayerfully considered what kind of gift to get. Then it's wrapped and placed under the tree, and on Christmas morning it's gleefully passed on to that one that's received the gift. And the gift is there, but the gift is refused. The gift is not opened. It can be the most wonderful gift in the world the best wrapping paper that money could buy, the most beautiful ribbon that could be tied. But until that gift is received, it's not a gift. Perhaps you heard the story many years ago of a railroad uh, company owner, the train owner, had his own train robbed. That was in the days when mail and funds and money was carried by way of the railroads and had his own train robbed. He was ultimately caught and convicted and standing before the judge. And the judge happened to be his brother. And his brother, the judge, came down, took his robe off and placed it over on the man and said that he had, uh, by his determination, he had determined to free him of all charges and he is set free. The brother shook the robe off and put it back on the table and said, I refuse to accept it. I'm guilty. The judge put his robe back on, went back to the bench, and he pronounced sentence. He said, a gift is not a gift until accepted. Salvation is a gift of God through the shed blood of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's not personal until it is accepted. It must be accepted, and we must personally say by our own volitional choice, yes, the Lord Jesus Christ, come into my heart and save me. May I remind us, the Lamb is pierced. We saw in Exodus chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, the Lamb was slain and the blood was sprinkled. May I remind us in Isaiah chapter 53, the program of God says, Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He had no form of comeliness that we, should, that we see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. And it's speaking of 750 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is the Lamb of God. He is despised and rejected and ridiculed. And the Bible says in John 1.11, he came unto his own and his own received him not. The Lord Jesus Christ must be received. He must be accepted. The fact that he came into the world, that he is God come in the flesh, God incarnate, the fact that he loves you and he loves me and he loves all of the world and his, sin, his blood is sufficient for all of the world to be saved. It is not sufficient. It is not uh, rece- If it's not received, it is not efficacious. It has no benefit. The lamb is pierced and the program for the piercing of the lamb is that we might have salvation full and free. But we stand today in a world, we watch today in a world that ridicules and rejects and refuses to say yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. It's an amazing thing to me how we see year after year after year beginning about October, November, Cities, municipalities, regulations and rules out of the uh, superior-minded people that run our cities and our states and our nation. They will begin to say what can and cannot be done for Christmas. There are entire cities in our nation today that because of regulations in that city and rules, ordinances, refuse to allow any public Christmas decoration. Did you know that? In the United States of America, 
refuse to recognize. And because green and red uh, and uh, colors of that nature are usually used in the decoration of a Christmas tree and for a Christmas decoration, many municipalities say you can use blue lights and you can use different color lights, but you can't use the red and the green because that symbolizes Christmas. And after all, we know the separation of church and state. We can't allow you to do that. Jesus Christ is re refused and rejected and ridiculed and made fun of and denied. But the program of God is that Jesus Christ would be received and accepted because of his shed blood being beneficial for our sins to be remitted. We're talking about the lamb is pierced. And the program of God is Jesus Christ, the lamb of God, to come into the world. And the prophecy of Jesus Christ coming into the world 750 years before his birth said that he would be ridiculed and rejected, rejected by man. And that's exactly what we see taking place even today. We see not only the program but the plan or the pain. In verses 4 through 8 of the uh, a text that is found in Isaiah 53. The Lamb of God shed his blood on Calvary for us. Uh, there are two things that I want to think about about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, it's precious blood, and secondly, it's powerful blood. It's precious blood. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. The scripture says this, For as much as you know not that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain or empty conversation, that is your lifestyle, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Listen very carefully. When Jesus Christ shed his blood on Calvary's cross, it is precious blood. And that precious blood is being trumpled underfoot today by man that says Jesus Christ is not God. Jesus Christ has no place in our society. Jesus Christ cannot be, his name cannot be used unless it's in a swear word and a vulgar term. Jesus Christ is denied and ridiculed and rejected, but his blood is precious blood. In fact, in Acts 20, 28, the blood that flowed from Calvary's cross, the Bible says, was God's blood. Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh. And because of the virgin birth, because Jesus Christ came via the virgin's womb, Jesus Christ has precious blood. And there's some that say and want to argue on and the uh, de uh, debate on uh, what saves us. And there's some debate that's been raging since about 1988. It started with Bob Jones the second and uh, uh, John MacArthur where John MacArthur says it's not the blood of Jesus Christ that saves us, but it's his death. And it caused a great furor within the realm of theological circles and academic scholarship uh, where there's an argument and a debate. Listen, I want to settle that debate once and for all. It's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the precious blood of Christ that redeems us. It was through his death and the shedding of blood that it came about, but it's his blood that the scripture says is precious blood. There's an old song that says, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's precious blood. Precious blood. It's powerful blood. Hebrews 10, 1 through 10, and I'll not read all the verses, just verse 10. By the which will we are, by the which uh, will we are sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once and for all. Jesus' sacrificial blood was first, foremost, and final. No more need to have the shedding of the blood of bulls and goats. By the which we are sanctified through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ shed blood is final. Our enemy, Satan, can only be overcome by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
In fact, there's a wonderful text, and I'll not turn to it. I'll just share it with you in the 12th chapter of the Revelation text, and it's during the tribulation days when the martyrs of the faith will be uh, slain because of their faith. And in Revelation 12:11 says, And they overcame him, speaking of Satan, overcame him, the enemy Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And Jesus, and they loved not their own lives unto the death. How will they overcome in the days of the tribulation? How can one overcome? Satan. It is through Calvary and confession of faith and commitment to Jesus Christ. How can we overcome the evil one, the wicked one, Satan today? It is through Calvary's cross. It is through the precious blood, the powerful blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and our confession of our faith in him and our commitment to surrender and submit our lives unto him without the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no power for the church without the powerful, precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, there would be no such thing as Christmas or Christianity or salvation. The Lamb is promised. The Lamb is pictured. The Lamb is provided. The Lamb is pierced. But I want us to understand the Lamb is also positioned. The Lamb is positioned. Wonderful text in Revelation, the fifth chapter, beginning with about verse 6. The Scripture says, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and looked and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four, uh, and the four and the twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having one, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Listen, I want us to understand the first time that the Lord Jesus Christ came, he came in the cradle. The first time the Lord Jesus Christ came, he was crucified. But Jesus Christ is coming back, and he's coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords. He's coming again with a crown, having victory over uh, every God-hater, every Christ-denier, every Bible-denier. He has power. Notice two or three things. His power, his praise, and his program. His power is seen in Revelation 5, 6. He is the all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful. He is seen. He is risen. He's glorified. He's exalted. He's ruling and is reigning, and he is a in the position of authority and power, seated on his throne, having power over all of the earth, having power over all of the creation, having absolute controlling power as sovereign Savior over all of the earth. The Lamb is positioned. When Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross and shed his rich red royal blood for whosoever will may come. He was buried and on the third day he rose again having victory over sin, death in the grave, ascended back into glory. He's now seated on his throne ruling and reigning over all the universe. Some folks in Washington think they rule and reign. <laughs> I've got news for them. There's a king greater than any king Obama ever thought to be. His power, his praise. Revelation 5, verses 6 through 12, and we'll not read it all, simply referring to it. One day, according to the text in the Revelation Scripture, one day we'll all gather around the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ and we'll sing in Revelation 4 and Revelation 5. It tells us the song we'll sing and it gives us the stanzas that we'll sing. Study that in your leisure. And the song that we'll sing is, Worthy is the Lamb! Worthy is the Lamb! I can't sing now, but one day I'll be able to sing worthy is the Lamb around the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. May I remind folks today, if you can't praise him now, if you don't worship him now, if you're miserable in church now, you will be miserable in heaven because all we'll do throughout all of eternity is worship the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and will sing praises before the throne of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, throughout all of eternity. His power and his praise, but also his program. 
And I'll not read it, but for our edification, I'll just refer to it, and you can read it in your leisure. Revelation chapter 21, verses 22 through 27, says that there'll be no more sanctuary. The scripture says the sanctuary will be gone. Why is that so? Because we'll be in his eternal presence. There'll be no more substitute. There's no sun, because the sun, S-O-N of God, will shine and will uh, illumine all of heaven. There's no more sanctuary, no more substitute, and there's no more sin. In fact, in that text, I must read it, though. In that text, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 22 and following, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need for the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Verse 24, and the nations of them which are saved uh, shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth to bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not shut at all by day, and they shall not shut by night there. And they, verse 26, and they shall bring the glory and the honor and the nations into it, verse 27, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever uh, whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. And they which are written in the, notice, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. You realize in heaven the only ones that will be there, the ones that have their names written in the Lamb's book of of life. May I remind us there's no more sanctuary there in heaven. The program of God, no more sanctuary, no more substitute, no more sin, but no more sinners. Because in heaven, sin will be an alien thing because Jesus Christ rules and reigns. And there's that great provision that we find finally in Revelation chapter 22. And in 22, we find in that text, there's no more crying, no more curse, no more chasm. That is distance between man and God because we'll have his ever presence where we can praise him and honor him and worship him and sing worthy is the lamb throughout all of eternity. And then there's no more death and uh, because of there being no death, we'll be able to see him and sing all throughout eternity. There's an old song that I want to close with, an old song that reminds us and gives us a great deal of insight. Face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face what will it be when with rapture I behold him? Jesus Christ who died for me. Face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by. The question is, do you know him? The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. There are some believers that will spend this first Christmas in heaven. I've read this several times down through the years, and I'll read it for our edification because as I ponder this for Christmas message, there are those part of the body of Christ that are not with us this Christmas. They're spending the first Christmas in heaven. And this is a poem by Selma Renair, found in the Messenger of Truth. I copied it some 20 plus years ago. Let me read it for closing thoughts. I've had my first Christmas in heaven, a glorious and wonderful day. I stood with the saints of the ages who found Christ the truth and the way. I sang with the heavenly choir, just think, I who so long to sing, and oh, what celestial music we brought our Savior and King. We sang the glad songs of redemption, how Jesus to Bethlehem came, and how they called his name Jesus, that all might be saved through his name. We sang again with the angels the songs that they sang that blessed morn, when the shepherds first heard that glad story, that Jesus the Savior was born. Oh, darling, I wish you had been here. No Christmas on earth could compare with all the rapture and glory we witnessed in heaven so fair. You know how I always love Christmas. It seems so wonderful to me with all my loved ones around me. 
the children so happy and gay. Now I see why I loved it so. And oh, what a joy it will be when you and my loved ones are with me to share in the glories I see. So dear ones on earth, here's my greeting. Look up till the day dawn appears. And oh, what a Christmas awaits us beyond all our parting tears. Let me give you the little footnote on this poem. This poem was sent to us a number of years ago, this person writes. We found it again sometime before our dad spent his first Christmas in heaven. Dad passed away on December the 29th, 1990, after being sick for almost 20 months. We have many precious memories of him, and now he's up in heaven beckoning us to remain faithful. Let us all strive to live so that we may meet our loved ones there someday. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. 